Father, uh, Master Yeshua, your words uh, are the words of our heart this evening. Uh, you said the words that I speak are not my words, but the words of him that sent me. And so, Lord, uh, we all desire to speak your words and not our own. Not just me, but everybody here. I pray the promise of Zechariah that that golden oil from the throne would come through those golden tubes tonight and that you would anoint this entire congregation. Bless us, Lord, with your presence. And we believe you're here. We know you're here, but we're, we're desiring for more of your presence. And, and thank you for sending it in Yeshua's name. Amen. <clears throat> he is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. That's one of my favorite promises. I thought I'd throw that in before I get started here. The, uh, we've been working on chronology and prophecy forecast Earth, Earth's final events, autumn 2020 to autumn 2027, and we talked last night about how that we, uh, in order to understand the, the location of the last prophecies of the Bible, uh, since Daniel uh, asked the question, for the amount of time to the end, the end is the point we need in order to locate the prophecies. And, uh, and then we went through the chronology, part one and part two. And uh, tonight we're going to do the Bible Jubilee connections. And those Bible Jubilees are going to help to lock together the chronology that we studied last night. And uh, we also want to show that uh, the evidences from the Bible that it teaches that this world, that God has allotted this world 6,000 years uh, for the demonstration of sin. And I don't know how that happened, but uh, this is where we left off. Does that look familiar? Yes. Okay. Um, those were the the specific chronologic figures that we arrived at from the Bible um, with one exception, and that exception was the amount of time that Manasseh was in captivity, the amount of time that he wasn't reigning in Jerusalem. So we're going to connect. We're going to begin to find uh, the jubilees in the Bible, and again, the jubilees uh, we know, according to Leviticus twenty-five, are uh, go from Day of Atonement to Day of Atonement. So they're an exact figure that we have, so that we can check our chronology. And uh, the Bible teaches that the 50th year, in the 50th year, I guess we'll look at that here in a second, I'll, I'll read the text, but it teaches that the 50th year, uh, the Jubilee trumpet sounded, and uh, the uh, in that 50th year, uh, that was the Jubilee year. So there were 50 years, there were seven sets of seven, and there were seven, seven sabbaticals, seven cycles, seven seven-year cycles that makes 49 years, and the 50th year was the Jubilee. That's what Leviticus 25 teaches, but we'll look at that. Here it is. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. We're going to find out a little bit later. These Sabbaths are very important to the Lord. And anybody with a heart and desire, which I know you all have, to serve the Lord uh, should want to know when that is. 
Six years shalt thou sow thy field, and six years shalt thou prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. <clears throat> thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound. Notice again, on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement, so it's exact to the day uh, when that, that jubilee uh, is announced. Shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and ye shall hallow which year? The fiftieth year. That's really important. That fiftieth year is what? Holy. It's hallowed, okay? And proclaim liberty th throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Does that look like a type of deliverance there? Return every man unto his... That means Abraham's going to get his possession that he was promised. And every man unto his family. And I know that touches a lot of hearts because there's a lot of people that would like to be reunited with family. It's coming really soon. So, these are the Jubilee Connect points that we're going to look at. Um, one of them is given to us... Uh, uh, at the possession of Canaan, the one we just read. There's another one during King Hezekiah's time. There's one during King Josiah's reign. And there's a jubilee during the time of Queen Esther. And it just fits. It's not actually recorded as a jubilee. The other ones are clearly jubilees from the language in the Bible. This one just happened to be a deliverance. Uh, but it, 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 it's in the 50-year... Uh, cycle. And then the, the most important jubilee was the one proclaimed by Yeshua himself, okay, when he was here. The last and best one, uh, word on it, is from him. So the first one we're going to look at is the possession of Canaan. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, when, I, when ye come... Now, notice this. It's important because there's two conditions to this uh, beginning of the land cycle. This is the one we just looked at where the, he said, you know, it was going to start right here, and every seven years until the 49th and the 50th would be the Jubilee. But there's two conditions. A lot of people think, well, as soon as they went over Jordan, it must have started. But the language is clear that when you become into the land, which what? I give you. So there were two conditions. First, they had to enter it, and then it had to be given them as a possession. That's important. And then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years shalt thou sow thy field. There's that principle of needing to possess the land, and six years shalt thou prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof, but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. So if you go back and study the history on it, you'll find out they were fighting a battle for somewhere around five or six years there, and, and uh, they weren't gardening. They, were, they took down 33 kings. God did, but 33 kings, you believe that? That is amazing that they took down 33 kings in that short period of five or six years. He said to Joshua, be thou strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. So, I hope this isn't going too many at one time. It seems to keep changing when I'm not looking. So, <clears throat> Anyway, here, here's a s statement from Manuscript 21, 1899. The seventh year after they settled in Canaan was a 
Sabbath year. So that word settled is an important word. Uh, is a clue also. That's just a verification of what the Bible already told us. Okay. So now we're going to, interestingly enough, about all those connect points that we looked at at the very beginning, uh, not coincidentally, every one of them, the Lord ha in his kindness connected to the chronology that we studied last night. He didn't just say something about the Jubilee. He gave a connection from it to the chronology, and that's really important. So here's the chronology from the Exodus. You remember the Exodus was on our, our chronology. At the end of the 430 years, they came out of Egypt. You remember that last night? And so here we're going to take off from there and go to when they actually possessed the land. Um, their departure from Egypt to the departure from, you know, when they left Egypt, they went to the foot of Sinai, and then they built the tabernacle and so on. You can find out from Numbers 33, 3, and, and 10, uh, chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, that it was one year and 35 days from the time that they left Egypt until they left Mount Sinai and headed for the wilderness of Paran, okay? And then they camped at uh, I, I really have a tough time with that word, uh, but you see it there. Yeah, Kibroth Hat Hatava. We, surely there must be somebody here that knows how to say that. We have a lot of talent here. So anyway, they camped there for one month, Numbers 11, 18 through 20. Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days uh, at their next stop, Numbers 12, 14, and 15. The total journeying time... Deuteronomy 1, 2 gives us the total journeying time from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea was 11 days. Okay, so, and then they searched out the land, remember, for 40 days. And then we'll, uh, I, I'd really like to read this next one to you because it, if I don't have it on the next slide, let me look. Yeah, I think I took a shortcut there. So I'm going to get my Bible out and read that one because I think it's really important. But um, so we have um, how, how much is that? A year and 35 days plus 30 more days is a year and 65 days. 72, 83, and 223 days. Is that right? 65, 65. 72, 83, 123, 123 days. So we have a year and 123 days, okay? So that's about a year and four months. Okay. So, so tuck that away. That was to, it was a year and four months until they got to Kadesh Barnea. Okay, I want to read about that because there's some encouragement in that. I promised last night, uh, okay, that I was going to give some encouragement for those of us that are older in years. Um, Joshua, I'm looking 14, 6 through 15. And, um, uh, I don't want to get waylaid too far on this, but I, I wanted to read to you because the, the Lord used Caleb to give this chronology to us. And uh, now notice the temple was, at, uh, the sanctuary, the tabernacle was at Gilgal at this time. They moved it shortly thereafter to Shiloh, and that's when the, the actual land cycle began. But it says in uh, Joshua 14, verse 6, then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. You see that right there? So we have a connection here to when 
to when he was sent out. So we might not even need that 40 days there. But anyway, it's we'll see. It doesn't matter. He, he sent him to, in to spy out the land when he was how old? 40. Okay. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and the, thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord thy God. And now, verse 10, Behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day, how old? Eighty-five. Okay. So we have then, oh, we've got to read the next verse. This is the encouraging. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. So how old was he? 85. The Lord can do it, brothers and sisters. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now, he says, for war, both to go out and to come in. Okay? So anyway, you read on, you find out he, uh, and, and so Joshua blessed him and gave him his possession. Okay? And you read on and you find out that they started uh, apportioning the land there uh, in Gilgal. They moved the tabernacle to Shiloh that, that same uh, autumn and that uh, uh, finished apportioning the land. So when would have the land, that would have been when, I mean, he got his possession right there. And it says here in, uh, so anyway, to finish the addition there, that's uh, a year and four months, three or four months, depending on whether you use the 40 days, plus 45 is 46 and a few months, but it took them a little bit to move the tabernacle. So remember they left at Passover, which was in the spring, and the Day of Atonement, the beginning of the land cycle, would have been in the fall. And so we have 46 and a half years uh, from the time they left in the Exodus until Caleb uh, and his the men that were with him from Judah went and got his inheritance uh, there from uh, in Gilgal. And it says in ver chapter 18, verse 1, And the land had rest from war, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, and the land was subdued before them. In other words, I'm going to say they started gardening. Okay. So that's uh, the 46 and a half. And so we want to put that on our chronology line from the Exodus to the, the beginning of the 50-year cycle uh, when they possessed Canaan. Okay. So there's the first one. And then we want to move on quickly because... Uh, this is actually a hair longer than the one it was last night, and so I have to try to keep going, but I have trouble because I have things I like to say. But anyway, uh, Jubilee Connect point number two was Hezekiah's Jubilee. Now, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them, and he came in and decimated the land. Now, we're going to find out that <laughs> that he must have known the habits of Israel because he attacked them right in the, just before the harvest time of the 48th year when they were getting ready to lay up for both the 49th year and the 50th year. And he came in and completely wiped out the land. <clears throat> that was pretty discouraging since they hadn't, uh, you know, didn't have a chance to put up their food. So what were they going to do? It was, God was testing their, it was testing their faith. Were they going to go ahead and, well, we've got a plant now because uh, 
we don't have any, we didn't put up any food. And so <clears throat> it was either be obedient or maybe go hungry is what it seemed like to them. I didn't hear that. Um, yeah. And this shall be a sign unto thee. <clears throat> Here's how we know this was a jubilee year. This shall be a sign to thee. Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves. And in the second year, that which springeth of the same. And in the third year, sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. Now, this was a, what... Uh, a sign that when Hezekiah was praying and having a difficulty with the situation he was in, Isaiah came, and this was the prophecy and the promise of the Lord to them. He told them that you're going to eat. I am going to make that ground produce food for you for two years, and you're going to be able to eat to your fill just because I'm going to make it come forth. Okay. But we know it was a jubilee year because that's the, that's the only time when you have two years that the land, uh, you know, you eat from the, you know, just what's in the field is the only time you have two of them in a row is the last sabbatical and jubilee. So anyway, this is a statement from prophets and kings. The land of Judah had been laid waste by the army of occupation. But God had promised to provide miraculously for the needs of his people. When had he done that? And he'd also done it when he gave them the statutes, too, because he said that I'm going to make it produce more in the 48th year. You know, you're going to get a bumper crop in the sixth year of the cycle, and then you'll have enough. But, but so God had he promised him right then, but he'd promised him in the statute. That he would, he provided miraculously for him in the sixth year of every cycle. So, he does the same for us. He does the same for us. To Hezekiah came the message: This shall and so this shall be a sign unto thee: Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves in the second year, that which springeth of the same. So, um, here's what it looks like graphically. Remember, it was the fourteenth year of Hezekiah that that happened, I, I probably, yeah, well, you can see the scriptures on this slide, too, up there, Second Kings 18, 13, uh, in the 14th year of Hezekiah is when Sennacherib came in against the fenced cities of Judah and took them and decimated the land, and notice the 14th year of Hezekiah is a, is a spring to spring year, because that's how the, that, that's how it works, uh, you know, from, from, uh, first new moon, you know, to the next first new moon. But uh, uh, but the agricultural years are offset there uh, six months uh, from autumn to autumn. And so you can see that the sabbatical in Juba, so 279 years in to his 14th year, to, to the end of his 14th year, is what we had on our chronology. You remember we had... Hezekiah in our list of kings. So we're connected to this because we know it was in the 14th year of Hezekiah that the attack came. And uh, so we have there another year and a half from the end of his 14th year to that same change in cycle that we had um, at uh, Canaan. So 280 and a half years from the divided kingdom up to the beginning of the Jubilee cycle during Hezekiah, and that comes out at 280 and a half years from the beginning of the divided kingdom. Look at the number between those two Jubilees. It's exactly 750 years, which is 50-year increment. And so we we see how the Jubilees lock together the main chronology. Okay, so the Lord has done this for us because uh, he wants us to know, remember the statement said, where we are in this earth's history and what we can expect in the time to come. That statement we look... look so... Here's uh, Jubilee Connect point number three, Josiah's great Passover. 
you could call it Ezekiel's 30th year, but you'll see why I say that here in a minute. But the actual Jubilee was at the great Passover of Josiah, okay? So now it came to pass in the 30th year, this is Ezekiel 1.1, 1, 1, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chabar, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God in the fifth day of the month, which is the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. That was also the fifth year of Ezekiel's captivity because they were taken at the same time. He and King Jehoiakim, which was a young king, the one that came out with his mother uh, and gave himself up to... to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, if you were an Israelite at that time and, and lived your life according to covenant law relative to 50-year cycles, cycles by which all business dealings, buying and selling, and releasing of contracts, servants, and property was done, wouldn't it be understood what the 30th year meant? This is the 30th year of the Jubilee cycle, and, and notice... Let's see, I'm, I keep hitting the button, but anyway. But notice how the Lord graciously didn't just tell us the Holy Spirit, didn't just tell us His Spirit, didn't just tell us it was the 30th year of the cycle. He says in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, and then he goes on in the text and says, in the fifth day of the month, which was what? The fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. So he not only told us it was the 30th year of the of the Jubilee cycle, but he told us what year it was in the king's reign so that we could attach it to our chronology. And if you go back, uh, remember it was in the fifth year, in the fourth month, so that makes it about four and a half years, okay? Because you have f four full years and you're partway into the fifth year. Uh, so we have four and a half years for Zedekiah's part. Jehoiakim only reigned uh, a quarter of a year before uh, he was taken captivity there, t taken captive. And Jehoiakim reigned 11 years, and Jehoahaz a quarter of a year. And so that leaves, coming back to 30 years, that leaves um, you 14 years into the last part of Josiah's reign. Well, Josiah reigned 31 years, so if you take 14 from 31, it gives you 17. That's right. And the great Passover, it gives you 17 full years, and the great Passover was the first few days of the 18th year. Okay, so that's, it was right at the great Passover when you come back uh, th this amount of time. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor the kings of Judah, but in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was holding to the Lord in Jerusalem. So... We have the evidence that it was the 30th year, and we come back and we find ourselves at the great Passover. And so, uh, I don't know if I have the graph. I have a graph of that. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it, it'll show up. The 30th year, harmonizing, the pioneers, I just want to say the pioneers are already on this. This is not... Knew it. I mean, these guys were deep Bible students. And this is from Silver, 1850 Silver, Sylvester Bliss's analysis of sacred chronology. And he says, the 30th year harmonizing with the 5th of Jehoiakim's captivity would date from the 18th of Josiah, the year when there was holding such a Passover. It's never been observed from the days of the judges. The year of the observance of that Passover was doubtless a jubilee. And the 30th year of Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1 is evidently the 30th from that jubilee. So we put that in our uh, the, the list of kings here. We go back. Uh, anyway, I can go in here and try to find it and read it. But that's where it fits. 
You can, you can search it out in your own time. Excuse me? Yes. It was the springtime of the Jubilee year. It was in the springtime of the Jubilee year. It was in the middle of the Jubilee year. Because the Jubilee goes from Day of Atonement to Day of Atonement. And I've, I have papers at home that have the in intricacies of all that laid out, counting back and, and stuff. But, you know, for the sake of presentation to people, you know, if you, you, you need to do that work, you know, on, on your own. But, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a six-month... Yeah, and you have to keep you have to keep track of the that uh, you have to keep track of the uh, whether or not you're at the beginning of the jubilee year or the end of the jubilee year and what it's talking about. In order to get them to line up in 50-year increments, you have to use apples and apples all, all the way down through. So uh, this is just a little side tour, and we won't spend much time on it. But I said how important the Lord viewed his sabbaticals, and this is just called Zedekiah's sabbatical. And I thought, well, it'd be a good idea to check this against the Jubilee cycle because it, it needs to fit the Jubilee cycle, the sabbatical cycle. So as I was studying Jeremiah and, and studying this, this is what the Lord said to him. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. At the end of seven years, let ye go, every man, his brother, in Hebrew, which had been sold unto thee, and when he hath served thee six years, thou shalt let him go free. Okay? We talked quite a bit about that this morning. Uh, had some good discussion about that this morning. And ye were now turned and had done right in my sight in proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor. But ye turned. In other words, they turned and then they turned again. And caused every man his servant and every man his handmaid whom he had set at liberty at their pleasure to return and brought them into subjection to be unto you for servants and handmaids. So they just couldn't do it. And so here's what the Lord said to them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty. I, behold, I proclaim a liberty for you. Saith the Lord to the sword. This was the final destruction of Judah here that he's predicting. He meant, he meant for those Sabbaths to be kept and for the things that he said to be done on those to happen. I proclaim a liberty for you to the sword, to the pestilence, to the famine, and I will make you to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth. And interestingly enough, one of the things, if you go back and read the story, one of the things you find out is that, uh, that you know, we open the gate. We do this, too, you know, because this, this last was our sabbatical year. But you, the animals, you know, can come into the garden area and eat and stuff. You know, we haven't fenced out, you know, went for six years, you know. And so they can come in and eat. But and so what he did is he says, I'm going to feed you to them. And you can read about it. I mean, I'm saying the Lord is serious about his statutes after what was it from from what we learn in Ezekiel, 420 years of pleading with him. I mean, it's not like he's not long suffering, but I mean, it was bad when it happened. Okay, so he, he's really serious about his statutes. Yes. To the what? Don't know. Yeah, it was when it was when Judah was finally taken and the city was burned and the temple was destroyed. Uh, so we're going to find out here and I'm not going to you can stay this in your own time but that that happened between the 10th and 11th year of Zedekiah uh, yeah Zedekiah he was the last king it, it, between his 10th and 11th year the siege and and everything that the Lord said there all happened in that in that sabbatical year and he did exactly like what he said and it's exactly 35 years 
from the Passover at Josiah's uh, Jubilee, which is in a seven-year increment. You see that. So it was this. It was the the let's see, be the fifth sabbatical cycle from the Passover at Josiah is when Jerusalem was finally destroyed. So we just put that in there as an extra checkpoint because the Bible said it was this. He proclaimed, when he says, I proclaim liberty for you, he proclaimed it at the right time. You know, the liberty in the seventh year. So here's checkpoint number four, and it's fairly simple. You remember in the first month, uh, the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast per, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month. To the twelfth month, that's the month of dark. You know what that means? They cast per from day to day and month to month. It means that they cast the lot. It was, you know, they it was a bad thing, but they cast the lot to all the different days to see which day, and then they cast the lot from month to month to see which month that they were going to make a death decree for God's people. That's what they were up to here. It was an Amalekitish scheme of Haman that he was, they cast per from day to day and from month to month. And we'll find out here. Anyway, it says to the 12th month, that's the month of Dar. Anyway, it fell on the 13th day of the 12th month is the day they set in the, in the, in the 12th year of Ahasuerus. And so as the days wherein the Jews, this is just... Um, the end of the story. As the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies in the month which was turned into them for sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day that they should make them days of feasting and joy and sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. So it sounds like a time of rejoicing for sure uh, when they were finally delivered. But if you put that in there on the timeline, you remember we talked about Ptolemy's canon last night. Well, the twelfth year of Ahasuerus, on the who was it was Xerxes was the was the uh, you know the king that you'll find on the canon is sixty three years in from uh, the decree of King Cyrus, and it's exactly one hundred and fifty years between the jubilee at Josiah's Passover, using the thirtieth year of Ezekiel, and Th this time that was set in Eth Esther, that they were set free. So it was exactly 150 years. Again, exact 50-year increments. And that was easy because it's just on the canon itself. So the last one, though, and I, by far the most important one, is the one that our Lord proclaimed, Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the <clears throat> tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. We're going to go back to our key text here in Leviticus 25. Shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a Jubilee unto you. So, Notice there's two things here happening. They were to do two things. They were to proclaim that it was the Jubilee year by making the trumpet sound. And then they were to proclaim liberty. Real simple. That's what, that was what it was about. And so we're going to look here and see that when Isaiah prophesied of the Lord beginning his public ministry, that he, we're going to see the same two things happen. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Isaiah prophesied, because the Lord hath anointed me. So we're going to see that he had already been baptized and the Spirit had descended on him when he made this announcement. And so it says, He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God. So in that verse, we see that he's proclaiming two things. One is what? Liberty, 
and the other is the year, okay? Now, the acceptable year of the Lord, we talked about that today, <clears throat> this morning, just providentially. Uh, the acceptable year of the Lord, if you look it up in the original, it means the delightsome year of the Lord. And what that means is that 50th year was when everything reset. And it was a delightsome year of the Lord. It guarded against the extreme rich and the extreme poor that we see today. Uh, because in God's system, everything worked perfectly. It was like a combination of what we call capitalism and socialism. You know, the two factions that are, you know, fighting against each other. It, it, what it was was, it was, and it was a, a balance between justice and mercy. And it allowed people to enterprise to a point, but not to the point that they would oppress their fellow man and their brethren. And so don't get in a fight about, you know, whether you're a capitalist or a socialist. Just be a follower of Yeshua, the master, you know, and his program, his statutes and judgments. So anyway, to pro so the acceptable year of the Lord was the Jew. It was the delightsome year of the Lord, and and he closed. Uh, now we're going to read. Um, I think that went to the next one. So now we're going to read about the account itself in Luke four. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me." So. The Spirit of the Lord was already upon him, just like it said. Because he hath anointed me, that was with John in the Jordan, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So there it is again, both things. He's proclaiming liberty, and did he not go forth at that very time to heal the, you know, heal the sick and to cause the blind to see and to do everything that that is talking about? And some people say, well, no, the real deliverance was at Calvary. Well, there's a certain truth to that, but the point is, is that Calvary, AD 31, rather than we're going to find out AD 27 here. The difference is, is that that happened in the what time of year? But when does the Day of Atonement get announced? In the autumn, right. And so this is the announcement of, of the Jubilee because that happens in the autumn. That's important to, for us to remember. And he closed the book and gave again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, what? This day is this scripture, Isaiah, fulfilled in your ears. And it says that he went forth from that time preaching the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so... So this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. <clears throat> now, he went forth to say the time is fulfilled. You'll notice that when he, he was, he, he knew the prophecies, you know, of course, and he gave the prophecies. But he had, but he he's going through the process just like you and I, you, you know that he you know he did not use any power that we cannot have access to. But anyway, he what he did was is he he knew what was coming. He knew the scriptures. He knew the prophecies. He knew what he was supposed to do. But obviously, he left the carpenter shop early. Would you say because he had. From the carpenter shop, he went. He was baptized in Jordan of John. And what did he say? Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then the, the 
The Spirit drove him up into the wilderness. He was there 40 days. When he came down, he went to Cana, okay, and uh, there his mother was wanting him to turn, well, wanting some more wine, wanting him to work a miracle. And what did he say to her, remember? My time is not yet come. Okay, so, um, but then he went ahead and worked a miracle for her. But he wanted to make sure and say it's, it's not time because, we need, because he wanted us to know when it was really time. And, he, and, he, and he, here he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And so, by the way, if you go back and read that in Luke 4, it says he went into the synagogue on which day? Well, what day was it? It was the Day of Atonement. Is the Day of Atonement Sabbath? Yeah, it is. So whether it was both Sabbaths or just one Sabbath, I don't know, but it was the Day of Atonement because he was announced in the, the Jubilee. At, at that point, he entered his public ministry. That was the announcement of, of en the entry into public ministry. So that's why I was saying he left, he left the carpenter shop early enough to get done the things that needed to be done in time to be able to, be, to, to make that announcement. And I'm quite certain that he went into the synagogue on that day to make that announcement. And so Dr. Hales argues that as the Savior, again, the pioneers are on this. This is not new information. Dr. Hales argues that as the Savior was to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord in the day of vengeance of our God, Isaiah 61.1, and as he closed the book when he had read the former clause of this prediction, you notice he didn't read the part about the day of vengeance? That's the one we're coming up to. Okay, so that this must have been a year of jubilee. Analysis of Sacred Chronology 1850 by Sylvester Bliss again. And... So, remember we talked about the 457, that young man last night that was here asked this question about the 2300 years and the, you know, the 457 date, and I think he's doing school tonight, but um, uh, this is the answer to his question. But the 457 date that was on Ptolemy's canon if you go to Daniel 9, you find out that it was going to be 483 years to the anointing. And so if you go from 457, which was the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, there were three decrees, and when they all three finally got made. But interestingly enough, the last one, when it says restore and rebuild, uh, the one there in the seventh year of uh, Artaxerxes, uh, the last of the three commandments, one was by Cyrus, uh, one was by Darius, and one was by Artaxerxes. Um, and so the, the reason the last one is so important is because it said both to restore and rebuild. And they, they had been commanded to go back and start and rebuild, but the restoration meant the restoration of the kingdom worship system which is what we're doing here. And that was an important aspect of that prophecy. And it was Artaxerxes' decree that covers that, uh, that commandment for allowing them to restore their worship as well as their rebuilding. So, and there's Daniel 9.25. There's the verse that says, after the seven weeks and, and 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks, that that would that was to unto Messiah the Prince or the anointing of the Lord in the day for year application. And so 27 AD autumn is exactly 500 years from the Jubilee on our chronology line that 
uh, in the time of Esther, which was exactly 150 years to the Jubilee at Josiah's Passover. So how many witnesses there do we have on this side of our question mark there? How many witnesses do we have as to the Jubilee cycle? Huh? We actually have, well, I'll, I'll just answer my own question. We have two on the side we're not looking at right now, the earlier side, one at Canaan and one during the time of Hezekiah. And on this side, I don't know why, on this side, we have three. And really four, if you want to count Zedekiah's sabbatical. Okay. So, and they all line up locking together those figures that we looked at last night. So, period number seven, we should be able to solve for because we know it's exactly, has to be in an exact 50-year increment uh, between, uh, between uh, Hezekiah's uh, jubilee and the one during the time of uh, Josiah. And here's what it looks like. And the only reasonable 50-year uh, inc increment or amount it can be is 100 years based on how long uh, Manasseh could have lived. He couldn't have lived. It had to be more than 50 because he reigned for 55, but it couldn't have been 150 because he couldn't have lived that long. Okay? So it was 100 years, and based on our line of chronology, that makes that period there 12 years that he was in captivity. And we're going to find something out interesting about that period. Um, here, here it, I'm just saying 12 years is reasonable. Again, this is from Analysis of Sacred Chronology 1850 by S Sylvester Bliss. And when he, Manasseh, was in infliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Remember, we talked about that last night. He was out of his reign. He wasn't reigning in Jerusalem. Into his kingdom. He was in captivity. Dr. Hale supposes, now this is him supposing, it was about 12 years. And the reason he supposed that was because the, the king that took him captive died 12 years after he was taken captive. So, but I believe it's 12 years because of those lock points in the, in, in, in the uh, jubilees. So, <clears throat> we'll move, try to move right along here because what we want to do now is find the entrance of sin, the length of the history of the world, the entrance of sin, and and conclude at the fact that we are approaching the end of the world with blinding speed. So there are the periods, and period one, those were Bible figures straight out of the Bible, period two, straight out of the Bible, period three, straight out of the Bible, anyway, right on down. Those are all Bible figures. The 12-year period is arrived at through the Jubilees. And it, at, it totals up at, to this year, 2020, the autumn, which we just passed the Day of Atonement uh, of 2020, at 6,052 years from creation to where we are now, okay? So, and here is what the Jubilee periods look like. From creation, it was 2,559 years until they possessed Canaan. 750 years to Hezekiah's Jubilee, another 100 years to Josiah's, 150 to Esther uh, and Mordecai, and 500 years to Jesus' declaration. And since then, we have been 1,993 years. Okay? So, all that dates creation back at about 4,032 B.C., and 2020 gives us the 6,052. Okay, so that's the, 
that is the summary of the chronological periods having solved for period number 12, which was the one that, was, that we were missing last night. Uh, let's see. Now, somebody I talked to today, I'm going to do this really quick, but somebody I talked to today, I was telling them that, you know, I'm doing this from the Bible, and I should be doing it from the Bible, and we should do everything we do from the Bible. But Sister White makes some comments that, that tend to uh, fast forward the process. And so here's a, just a few of the comments. If you go through and read, she pretty much has an overlay lock-in of these periods that we've been studying. Okay, we'll just look at a few of them here. It says, the covenant made with Abraham was how much? Remember that long process I went through to show that last night? But, um, so, before Sinai, there it is. Okay, signs of the times. The ark remained in Shiloh for how long? Until the sins of Eli's house, it fell into the hands of the Philistines. So what that one tells us, is that the pioneers were using the 450 years for the period of the judges, but that's not possible. And, it, and they let, and they kind of set 1 Kings 6.1 that we used aside. But this statement here verifies that 1 Kings 6.1 is the actual figure to be used. And when Paul said the 400, by, that they judged Israel the space of 450 years, if you go back and study the judges, you'll find out that the judges judged in different tribes and there were overlaps in the, in other words, it, there was a judge for, um, take Manasseh for instance, and then there was a, one of the other judges judged one of the other tribes. They weren't necessarily sequential because they weren't all judging the same tribes, but they did judge Israel for the space of 450 years. The reign of Darius was honored of God uh, so anyway, th what this one tells us is a couple things. It tells us that from the fall of Babylon to Cyrus's decree was two years. That's from 538 to 536. And then it also tells us that the, what we noticed last night, we looked at this one, about the 70 years began with the first company and ended with the decree of Cyrus. And if you, if you take the, uh, this one's an interesting one because it, it locks the 536 date to the 457 date, which we know to be, you know, true, the, the 457 date. So basically, about, you have, uh, it was about 70 years until he came to the throne and remember the decree, the third decree to restore and rebuild was... Um, the third decree to restore and rebuild was in his seventh year. Okay? So, how many would that be? If it was about 70 years from the time of Cyrus' decree, and then his, when he came to the throne, and then seven years later was 457, that would be 77 years, right? Well, in the, in the canon, it's 79, but it says about... 70 years so that's a that's a pretty close verification you know we're not you know making a real big bust here okay so and then in AD 27 Jesus at his baptism received the anointing of the Holy Spirit and soon afterward began his ministry then the message was proclaimed the time is fulfilled now this just a review of the last one, and we've already seen this, but it shows all the jubilees. But what we're going to do now is we need to decide because we're, what we're going to see is is that we're going to see that it's not the age of the earth that's going to be six thousand years. It's the long. It's the plan of salvation and the long suffering of God with sin. Okay, that's six thousand years. We must know the truth that only 6,000 years have been allotted us for the demonstration of sin. And we need to know when it begins and ends. So, 
Again, because the prophecy was, how long is it to the end? So we will now look at some evidences of God's week of restoration, his period of long-suffering and the plan of redemption. Now notice, the, one of the first things we want to talk about here is the fact that it is 6,000 years, and there's several evidences here that the world, uh, that the demonstration of sin will be 6,000 years. Um, and I, one of them, uh, I'll just give you a little preview. One of them has to do with Second Peter, where it says, that with God, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. And it goes right on and said, for God is what? Long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. The context of that verse is uh, mockers saying, where is the promise of his coming? For all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So, yeah, since the fathers fell asleep. So that that'll be one of the verses. Also, the fact that uh, what what God said in the time of Noah, um, my spirit will not always strive with man. His days shall be yet a hundred and twenty years. So again, it's it's the it's the God's long suffering. It's His spirit striving with man, and a hundred and twenty jubilee years or 50-year cycles, is 6,000 years. 120 times 50 is 6,000, okay? So while so the, the 120 years to the flood was typical of how many jubilees it would be to the end. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So, and then Revelation 20 says six times that there's going to be a thousand year rest. Okay. And that the enemy will be bound here a thousand years. It doesn't say a thousand and one or nine hundred ninety nine. When God says he's going to be bound a thousand years in Revelation 20. That, mean, that means we're not going over time. That's encouraging to me. So. And then you'll notice things like. Well okay let's look at Adam's day. God said, in the what? In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. How old was he when he died? 930. So did he, de he died within the first day of God's long-suffering because after he sinned, there was a immediately an atonement. There was a, there was a Savior found. And so... He died in the first day of God. He would have died instantly if the Savior had not stepped in for us as a human race. So that's one day of God's long suffering. And then the other uh, point, in terms of the week of restoration, uh, you have the beginning of the world and the, the last days or the end of the world. And if you divide that, it would be right in the middle, right? Beginning days, end days. First days, last days. Okay, so you find the apostles saying things like, now in the end of the world, w were we in the end of the world by the time they said that? Yes, we were. They were about 4,000 years in. Or now in these last days. Okay, so that's also an evidence that at least we know by the time they were in there, we were past the tipping point is what that's telling us. We had gone from the early days to the end days. So with all those evidences, and probably mostly everybody here believes in 6,000 years, so I don't, I don't want to go through, I don't want to be tedious, but um, the other thing is, is that it is the, I, I do want to point this out, we, we can read some of these verses, but you all know them, and it is, it, it's, not just a, it's not just a good idea. It is the character of God to work for six and rest the seventh. It's, it is who he is. There is no better way to labor and rest eight, ten, 
There's just no better way. It's who he is, and he knows. So we could go through these verses, but it's the, it's the evidence from the character of God. But here it is in Peter. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. It says, there's one thing, and Peter didn't write a lot of books, that I don't want my church ignorant of. And what is it? But you can be, he, he doesn't want us ignorant of anything, but he says, be sure and don't be ignorant about this. That with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years. One day. Now, how many days did he make at creation? Six. Okay. And then the seven. You know of any other days? So, if a day is as a thousand years, then that's six thousand and one thousand. Because those are the only days he made. And if each one of them has is a thousand years, you just can't come up with anything but 6,000 and 1,000. So, uh-huh. Yeah. So, and again, the Lord is not slack. In other words, this was all the context of scoffers and mockers. And I, if I had more time, I'd love to talk about uh, that this chapter a little bit more, but I think we need to keep going here. Um, it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. In other words, where's the promise of his coming, about his coming? He's not slack concerning his promise. This is all in the context of his coming. As some men count slackness, but is what? Long-suffering. So again, it's the period of his long-suffering with us criminals, sinners. So, for a, for a thousand years are in thy sight as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. There it is from the psalmist. Um, there's the one I mentioned in Noah. My spirit will not always strive with man. And there's the millennium. A couple statements. 6,000 and 8,000, those are from great controversy. This is an interesting one from Job. He will deliver thee in six troubles. That would be the 6,000 years. But what about the seventh one? There shall no evil touch thee. You are my children. There shall no evil touch thee, Job 5.19. So basically we establish that the 6,000 years is from the entrance of sin to the end of the end of the world, the deliverance of God's people. So, if the world ends at the end of 6,000 years, well, I guess we have to look at one more thing. We want to make sure that we know the end of the world is at the beginning of the last Jubilee year. I, I think that it was pretty clear from Leviticus 25 that that's a type, but let's look. It's, it's saying that every man's going to return to his possession and every man's going to return to his family. And here's what the pioneers believed. Heim said, We find that on the tenth day of the seventh month in the fiftieth year, the Jubilee trumpet was always to be blown and redemption granted to all. I think their song tonight was one of the greatest evidences because there have been many songs, many poems, many saints that have longed to live to the final jubilee. It's everywhere. Poems, um, statements, but we'll look at it from, from the scripture too. And redemption granted to all the land. Let any man read carefully the connection of this subject, and he must surely see this is a most striking type of the glorious deliverance of the people of God and of the whole creation which is now groaning under the curse when the Redeemer shall come to Zion and accomplish the redemption of the bodies of his saints and the redemption of the purchased possession, see Romans 8, 19 through 23, Ephesians 1, 9 through 14. Our blessed Lord will therefore come to the astonishment of all them that dwell upon the earth and to the salvation of those who truly look for him on the tenth day of the seventh month of the year of Jubilee. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, although one rose from the dead. 
Yes. That's the song they sang. Do you notice the words? That's a statement from Review and Herald, November 29, 1881. The Lord is coming, let that be the herald note of Jubilee. And it said here in early writings, and we'll just go down, it's talking about the deliverance of God's people and the wicked could not look of them for the glory. Go right to Daniel chapter 12 and you'll see in, uh, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that be wise, the, they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So anyway, there's the never-ending blessing. And when does the never-ending blessing happen? Yes, but and at the Day of Atonement. Because that's when the high priest comes out of the sanctuary to bless the people at the end of the Day of Atonement. No. That's the simple answer. Okay. Um, but here she says, there was a mighty shout of victory over the beast in his image. This is the deliverance that Daniel's talking about in Daniel 12. Then commenced... The Jubilee, when the land should rest, and what? I saw the pious slave rise in triumph and victory and shake off the chains that bound him while his wicked master was in confusion and knew not what to do. We don't know who of us that's going to be when that time comes, but uh, by God's grace, we're all uh, intend to be faithful. Uh, Anyway, soon there appeared the great white cloud. Here's a, here's a poem that talks about it. Uh, it says, O glory to God, it's coming again. Tis the glad jubilee of the children of men. Then blow ye the trumpet, shout glory and sing, and join in the praises of Jesus the King. We shall dwell evermore in the land of the blessed in that grand jubilee in that Sabbath of rest. Now take note of those words, grand jubilee. Because that's familiar language to our pioneers. A grand jubilee is the 50th, 50 year, it's 2,500 years. A, a grand jubilee, it's called the, Ju William Miller called it the jubilee of jubilees, or the grand jubilee. So take note of that. We're going to see it as we close up here. It says, if all will take hold of the work in the spirit of self-sacrifice for the sake of Christ and the truth... It will not be long before the Jubilee song of freedom can be sung in all our borders. It should be enough evidence that. So the world ends in a, in, 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 at the end of 6,000 years, he lets the prisoners go, uh, according to this statement in Great Controversy. The world ends at the, the deliverance is at the beginning of a Jubilee year. And we're going to see which one by God's grace here. Uh, so we want to locate the 6,000 years. We've established that the, we've established that the, uh, the 6,000 years ends on a jubilee. So when does it begin? It has to because 6,000 is evenly divisible by 50. And there are 120 of them. So it also had to happen at the beginning. And so let's look. Um, here's how then. So we see that the 6,000 years also begins a jubilee cycle. Would you agree if the fact that it, it, the deliverance comes? So that's an important point. And now we're going we're gonna to do our final move here. Um, this is the book of the generation of Adams in, the, in Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. So remember Cain killed Abel and when Seth was born, Eve said, The Lord's given me another seed in place of Abel, whom Cain slew. So we know that sin had to enter before this. Okay? So we have 130 years to work with 
Now, we want to know where the sin entered the world. We know it's in a jubilee year. And so the only way we can determine that in the first 130 years, notice I've highlighted the possession of Canaan. Okay? And from our, from our study that we've done, that jubilee came in 14... If you go back from 2020 to that jubilee, it happened in 1473 B.C. Okay? So let's look. 1473 B.C., there's only... We know that's a jubilee year, and from our chronology, it, there's only three places that that hits in that first 130 years. You see that? So, it has to be, sin had to enter at one of those points. So, this, is, this was the jubilee, the year when they entered Canaan. And if the, if the entrance of sin was on a jubilee year, it had to be in a 50-year increment from this point right here. Okay, so, and there's only three places, 2,450 years back, 2,500 years back, or 2,550 years back, that hit in that period where we know sin had to enter somewhere. Okay, so we're going to see, we're going to look at the 4,023 one first, nine years in. Look at those three figures. You might give you a clue based on something I already said. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> that's right. So we're going to look at the other one just to make sure. It says, uh, oh, yeah, okay, so there it is. The end of the 6,000 years in 1977. That was the year my daughter was born, <clears throat> actually. So it didn't happen. Uh, let's look at the other one. 3923, that would put it in 2077. I don't know, you could probably look at world events and figure that one out, but uh, that'd be a long time away. But, but we're going to figure out bib biblically, because that's what's important. And uh, I thought it was on the next slide, but I'm going to have to look at my notes again. Yes. I, I'm listening. It doesn't look like it, but I am. Ellen White said Christ should have come ere long this. So where does that fit in? What, what does she mean by that? Well, it also says we can hasten his coming. But when we hurry as fast as we can, he's going to come right on time. <laughs> That's my answer to that question. So, it's... Um, I was looking here. Um, there's... Let's see if I can find it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. That's a good point. And, and you know, as I'm thinking about you saying that, uh, you hear people complaining, you know, how did I end up on this planet? And how come I'm in this sin mess? And if Adam hadn't done that, and, you know, like maybe we would have done better if we were perfect and in his place. But, but, but think about it this way. Don't complain from the study we had on the first night we all have an opportunity to undo what he did. So are we going to do the same thing he did, or are we going to take the opportunity? What, what will we do about it, brethren? That's the question. And so I wanted to say about this, this 2,450 back and show how that can't be. I'll just read here because it'll be easier for me. Um, 21 years is not enough time reasonably. See, that would be 
uh, 21 years from when Seth was born. That's not enough time, and the statutes come in here, wouldn't you know it? It's not enough time for Adam and Eve to conceive and bear two children, maybe more if a daughter was in there. It just mentions Cain and Abel. Have them both grow up, reach manhood, develop occupations, leave home, and be responsible for their own sacrificing. Adam would have sacrificed for his family until his boys were at least how old? Well, if they were ministers, uh, but even and that's that's right. But even if they weren't, okay, twenty years was the age change from uh, what they called a, a child or youth to manhood. E either way, I like the thirty better because it really blows us out of the water. So, and, and I have that here too. Um, in the, Le in the Levitical law, 30 years, what Richard was quoting, was the requirement for the Levites to sacrifice in the tabernacle service, Exodus 30, 14. At any rate, in addition uh, to a few years for the first two births and 20 years to be of age, uh, and Eve also had to have time to conceive and bear who? Seth. It, so it's it pretty much blows it out of the water as a possibility because I, I'm i sure that Adam did not let them go until uh, these statutes were in his heart. These things were embedded in his heart uh, from the very beginning. The law would never have had to been stated if man had never sinned because they were already in him like they're going to be in us pretty soon so anyway it's the 2500 there is the only one left and um, the significant thing about that figure is it's a jubilee it is a jubilee of jubilees or grand jubilee uh, from the time that man lost Eden until they were possessed the earthly promised land. It was exactly uh, 2,500 years. So uh, we have the end of the 6,000 years in 2027. It, it's, it's amazing the accuracy and the absolute exactness of what God is doing here if you look at the 4,000 years and the 2,000 years and in Sister White's writing she breaks the world up in 2,000 year increments just like that 2,000 and 4,000 and 6,000 and we're going to see that here in a second uh, in our Jubilee chart but 2027 is, is the end of the 6,000 years. And so, there it is. The, the Jubilee figures go 2,500, 750, 100, 150, and 500. And it is exactly 4,000 years, which isn't even what we were working with. We were working back, you notice, from the, the Jubilee cycle at Canaan and just going back 50-year increments. But it is exactly 4,000 years from the Day of Atonement, and I, I want to submit that the Day of Atonement is the day that sin entered the world because there was no atonement needed until that. So it was the first day of atonement, okay? And so exactly, and you can read some statements, Christ came, when that clock hit, he came exactly on time. And you can uh-oh. And you can see it right here from the entrance of sin to 27 A.D. So exactly how long is it going to be from 27 A.D. to 2027 A.D.? It's exactly 2,000 years. And what day does the Jubilee come on? The Day of Atonement. 
So it's uh, here it says in review and herald Christ in the wilderness of temptation. Now think about this four thousand years here, and what happened at that end of it, and what happened at this end of it, and then we'll read this statement. Christ in the wilderness of temptation stood in Adam's place to bear the test he failed to endure. In that same autumn of 27. Here Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. Separated from the presence of God, the human family had been departing every successive generation farther and farther from the original purity, wisdom, and knowledge which Adam possessed in Eden. That was what I was saying. He, he had the law in his heart uh, originally. Christ bore the sins and infirmities of the race as they, as they existed when he came to the earth to help man. In behalf of the race, with the weaknesses of, of fallen man upon him, he was to stand the temptations of Satan upon all points wherewith man would be assailed. So, here it is. Here's an overview of what we've studied. And uh, notice where the Jubilees hit. You have 40 Jubilees from the fall to Abraham. 40 Jubilees from Abraham to Christ's baptism and 40 jubilees from Christ's baptism to the end. That's 2,000, 2,000, and 2,000. And Moses, that is a, an image of Moses' life. Do you realize that? Moses was in, in, uh, born and raised in Egypt for 40 years. Then he went for 40 years into Midian, okay, and at the end of that period, what I wish I could point to, to Christ there where the other 40 is, he came out to do what? Deliver the people, right. And when the next 40 years was over, he was about ready to enter what? Yes. So his whole life is a type of the history of the world uh, and he is really sad that he made that mistake because it it would have been perfect otherwise because he would have been translated without seeing death. So um, it's also 70 jubilees. I should go to my notes here. There's some really interesting correlations with where the Lord put these jubilees. I just read for a little bit because I don't remember all this always. Um, from Satan and the defeat of Adam and Eve, it was 50, 50 jubilees to the first entrance into Canaan. I already said that. From Haman and the victory of Mordecai and Esther, it will be exactly 50 jubilees or a grand jubilee to the second entrance into the heavenly Canaan. And on the 50th day, or excuse me, I'll just go on. From the battle and eviction from Eden, it was 70 jubilees until the death decree and Israel's deliverance in the time of Esther. So from the eviction of Eden to the death decree in the time of Esther is 70 jubilees. But from the uh, restoration to Canaan, it will be 70 jubilees until the death decree and jubilee entrance at the time of the end. Looking at the overall, though, it's 120 jubilees, and the Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with man. His days shall be yet 120 years. So the Lord says, teach us to number our days. Yes, and so therefore he expects us to do that. Now, I would just say this in closing, that we've been working hard at this to understand the end date, but remember, the reason we want to know that, <clears throat> the, we saw the other night that the enemy would have us to focus down here, but the Lord was wanting us to know when the trouble was coming. 
And so we're going to use this, this, we're going to go to Daniel and Revelation in the next couple evenings, and we're going to see how the Lord wants us to locate and, and, and not be an ignorant people, but know what our bearings are in these last days that we're going into. And, and so we'll do that tomorrow night, I guess. Um, let, let me say prayer, and then we'll, then maybe we'll even take some questions, if you want to. You want to record the questions, or? Okay, never mind. Go ahead. Um, I, if I understand this correctly, then that means that Adam and Eve were 58 and a half years in Eden, mm -hmm. enjoying Eden's perfection before the fall. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Well, we'll we'll cover that in the next couple of nights. But and part of my answer to that question is, how long was Lucifer next to the throne of God before he defected? That was a long time. Yeah, he was there a long time. He was called Son of the Morning. I believe he was one of the Lord's first creations. So uh, the amount of time isn't so much. Uh, I believe they were well instructed, but something went wrong as I understand it they got separated and Eve ended up out by herself so you said at one point that it was 6,052 years from the beginning and until now and then it kind of been saying only 6,000 where'd that 52 years go okay so the 6,052 was from creation to where we are right now in 2020, okay? The, uh, the, uh, that's the 6,052. The 6,000, though, goes all the way to 2027. And I'll draw you a picture. It'll be way easier. But, but the, uh, the 6,000 goes from... Uh, was it 59 or 50? It was 59, wasn't it? Goes, the 6,000 goes from 59 years in from creation to seven years from now. And so you're, we're, we're kind of talking about two different things. We're talking about when creation started. Uh, or I mean, when, when, yeah, and the entrance of sin, and they were 59 years apart. And then we were talking about two different dates on this end, one where we're at now and the 2027, and I think that's where you got... Uh, slipped up, but I can draw you a picture if you... Okay. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so if they knew about the Jubilee in, the, um, in 1844 so well, they knew about the feast so well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why were they sure of the 1844 Day of Atonement being the time when Jesus would come back if it wasn't a jubilee. Okay, I can answer that question. And the, the answer to that question oh, is... And I just get a little tiny continuation of the question. Okay. So the 2300 ended on the Day of Atonement, but not on a jubilee. For sure that. Okay, so how could they figure it was the time when all the captives would go free if it wasn't a jubilee? They knew about the statute calendar. Okay. The answer to that question would be this, and I kind of answered it, but I didn't make it real clear. I'll try to make it clear now. Th that If you go back and study William Miller's writings, they used the 450-year 450 450 year space for the period of the judges instead of the, the, uh, the verse in 1 Kings 6.1, and that changed the age of the earth by over 150 years just the difference in what they were using and what we understand now. They, they did not use 1 Kings 6.1 that said that the 480th year uh, from, the, from the Exodus was the fourth year of Solomon. They used, uh, for the judges, the space of 450 years. <clears throat> and William Miller made the state <clears throat> statement. This is inspired. He made this statement. He said... <clears throat> If I have erred, we're, we're going to hopefully see this, and, and I hope we all 
our believers by the time we get done here. But he said, if I have erred, it is not in the layout of the prophetic periods, but in the chronologic history of the world. That was after the disappointment, he made that statement. So, so he knew himself that the prophecies were lined up right, but that there was something wrong in their chronologic history of the world. So he thought it was a jubilee? He thought it was a jubilee. Wow. Did you guys all know that? I recommend all his books. I, have, I marvel that when we were in school that we did not have those books. That, to me, I don't know where the responsibility, I know it comes from Satan, but I don't know where the responsibility that comes from, but, but uh, I mean, on an earthly basis, but I would not be, want to be responsible for not allowing that information to be taught and give a foundation to God's people until, I mean, look, we're, we're right up to the, to the wire now because uh, of that. Anyway, uh, Melody had a question, I think. This is my educated guess as to why we never got those books. Okay. It's because you look and see what the church is saying now about William Miller. They are minimizing him mm -hmm. significantly. Mm -hmm. And because th to them now, William Miller is an embarrassment mm -hmm. because nothing you know, the second coming did not happen in 1844. Yeah. Therefore, William Miller's prediction was wrong. So the, he's, William Miller is an embarrassment to the church for that reason. But in my opinion, his books are incredible, mm -hmm. incredible knowledge. Mm -hmm. But yes, Amen. the church never shared them with us. Amen. So. You're right on. I believe the same thing. That was spot on. Did you hear what she said? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and it does relate too to the well. I think that pro I think it all grew out of that. And, you know, even the time setting and those bold headings and all that stuff we covered the other night. I think it grew out of that embarrassment that Melody was just talking about. It was trying to cover up instead of just being honest and open and in the light of day. You know. So anyway, but we won't do us too much good to think. Okay. So, which books would you recommend us start with? Um, there's two. Uh, the one that I would recommend that you start with, boy, that's a tough question. I just, I just, I just, I just love them all. So, but that little one, the little one that I had here the other night that I showed called, uh, uh, by the way, The Inheritance of the Saints in Light and the uh, 1260 Days of Daniel, dissertation, the, dissertation of the true inheritance of the saints in light and the 1260 okay. days of Daniel and John is a is a if you want a little one and it's packed uh, is a good one but the the main one that gives you uh, if you want to understand about the seals and the trumpets and a lot of the prophecies the main one is called evidence from scripture and history of the second coming of Thank you. I think it's of the second, oh, just of the second coming about the year 1843. They were really into long titles back then. Yeah. Right. You want me to slow down? What? Yeah. Evident. From scripture yes. and history of the second I, I, coming. I want to speak instead of answering your question, but I'll answer your question. Evidence from, it, I, I just want you to think about that title based on what we've been studying. Evidence from Scripture and History of the Second Coming. No, I think it actually is just of the Second Coming. Oh, is it? Oh, okay, of Christ. She's got it. Thank you. About the year 1843. And I recommend those books. I recommend those books to everybody. Uh, huh? The ones out of print, I, I, I've been really busy. I've been, one of my loves and goals, and I hope somebody takes it up here, is to take that little book and put it back in print, uh, the one that's out of print. But you can get it in answer to your question. You can go to Amazon. You, you did that, didn't you, Judith? 
you, uh, it's on Amazon, and you can download it. You know, you can download it off Amazon. But as far as actually, they're, they're not in print anywhere. Uh, Leaves of Autumn used to print them. And I told you the other night, it, it was, had to be Providence that that guy had one of those on his shelf and sent it to me from Orion Publishing. And uh, so. Any other books by him that you would really highly recommend? Um, nothing that I can think of the title of right okay. now. There is one other one. It's, called, it's about chronology. Okay. But we can, I can show it to you. I brought them. Okay, thank so, you. Uh, okay. Oh, that's it. She just said it. What? Can you repeat it? Views of the prophetic... Views of the prophecies... And prophetic chronology... By William Miller. Okay. Any other quick questions before we uh, finish up here? I think it might be late if there's anybody that has to uh, go anywhere or do anything. So we, we, I am so thankful that your patience held out. This study is a little bit longer than the rest of them, but you can, we could have done half of it, but then you'd have probably forgot that half by the time we... Uh, I mean, I'm not being, you know, anyway... By the time we got the rest, it's just better if you can sh do it all at one time. So, uh, and then tomorrow night, we will begin to study Revelation 10 and talk about the little book. And uh, that is a wonderful study. So, let's pray. Master, our hearts are, it said that it was sweet to the mouth, but bitter to the belly. So our hearts are made glad at the thought of the approach. Uh, of that uh, great tabernacles that we're going to soon celebrate. Lord, we want to come up to the Feast of Tabernacles as it says in Zechariah 14 and just thank you for your grace and mercy I want to openly confess that these things are of you they come from you and uh, that uh, uh, the words that I've been sharing are your words that you've given I take no credit or glory but that Lord, you would be glorified and that your people would be blessed, that your people, Lord, would be awakened and that we might know that the end of all things is at hand. In Yeshua's name, amen.